Oops. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the stuff that I've been uh, working on with some other people and uh, just got some notes here. So no slides or anything. So hopefully I won't forget anything or ramble on as it were. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was, um, was uh, managing arrays and lib storage management. So we have, there are a lot of different storage arrays out there um, that cost a lot of money. There hasn't really been an open, so or uh, kind of, you can't just take a Linux box and really make it emulate one of those big guys because we have all the pieces, but they don't all really fit together really well. Uh, with uh, with the, the work on DM Thin, we now have a copy on write uh, volume manager, manager, which is awesome, and that uh, that's, that's gonna be key. Uh, the other thing that we haven't, that we've had, but it hasn't been able to be integrated, is uh, target support. We've had, um, we've been using IET or TGT. They're not really that easy to manage. They're just kind of the daemon, and there's no real API to them. You have to kind of have to use the command line to configure them. So it's not that friendly. So you could do, you could do it, but you'd be, you'd become a TGT expert, and you'd become an LVM expert, and then you'd be like SSHing into, into each target, and it's just not very fun. So what we've been working on is, uh, or a colleague of mine, uh, Tony, has been working on a pro program called Lib Storage Management, which isn't just a library. It's actually also a, a command line interface with a plug-in system so that you can uh, configure multiple different vendors' storage arrays using the same API. So this is um, trying to simplify. Each, each of these vendors has an API, a remote API already. Uh, a lot of them use SMIS, which is kind of the standard, but it's a standard that's so huge that everybody does it differently. So um, a lot of the plugins that Tony's been writing, they all use SMIS, but are adapted for the various uh, idiosyncrasies of each of the array vendors' uh, uh, setups. Um, but the, in addition to that, what, what I've been working on is something called Target D, which um, fits into the framework that lib storage management provides to let you pr use a generic Linux box with a little bit of setup like a storage array. And what it's doing is it's leveraging LVM, it's leveraging uh, the, kernel, the LIO kernel storage target, which is multi-protocol, which is really nice, and, um, and, put, and wrapping it up because both of those things have libraries that, uh, that help a lot and putting a remote interface on it that can then talk to lib storage management. So that's, um, this is really the first, uh, you know, that we're taking the, the, the pieces and we're putting them together and putting a bow on them. Um, so that's, uh, okay, so that's the first thing I want to mention. So the second thing is just specifically about APIs. So target D is possible because the, the things that we're leveraging have APIs. We're not shelling out to command line because that's horrible we're, and parsing the response because that's horrible. So. Um, I'm plugging for APIs here. Um, what you have is people. People are if something is hard, people aren't going to do it. So if you have, if you're saying, if you've written something that's like the user space interface to kernel code, and you have your 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 whatever your foo progs, and you're like, okay, my interface is people just parse the command line, and that's it. That's not good enough because people are just going to give up, and they're not going to use your things. So libraries help make that easier. Um, so you need to. It, it would be great if. Uh, People, if you don't just assume that people are going to be, there's going to be a sysadmin typing into a console to control your software, that somebody's that it's actually more likely these days to be um, to be Puppet or something like that that is configuring your software on the platform, it's going to be programmatic access 99% of the time, and the APIs make that easier and it makes it just it's just less loose when you're when you're uh, when you're uh, composing software to not layer it on top of a command line API, but to have an actual library. So that's what, um, that's what I've been pushing for. Actually, Target D started out as just supporting block remote storage. We've, we've, we have some uh, preliminary stuff to support uh, NFS, and so we've got some command line parsing for like the NFS stuff and for ButterFS, but it's a big goal of mine to get rid of that, and so I'll be talking about that, that in a minute. Um, so, so if you were here yesterday and you heard like about the LXC stuff and the, and the Creo, the com uh, you notice both of those had APIs. So the newer stuff, people realize that it needs to be automatable, and ha those things have APIs. It's the old stuff. It's the stuff from 2000 where there aren't APIs that maybe we need to go back and look at that stuff and figure out, uh, you, you know, in the in in the current point whether it makes sense to uh, to have APIs for that. So this isn't just a storage issue. This is all over the Linux kernel. It's power management. It's networking. Uh, it's uh, 
block device file system, obviously. Um, so it's something we need to work on. I also, just to compare, um, so, so libstorage management is the kind of the tool for configuring remote storage appliances. We also have SSM, which is kind of the tool to, 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 paper, to, to tie a bow around some of the, the differences between LVM and ButterFS. But right now, that's doing, that's parsing the command line. So I would uh, think that SSM is a good thing. What it's doing under the covers isn't a good thing to do long term. That, uh, that project may, sh should really be moving more towards using the under underlying libraries. It should be using libLVM, just like Target D is. It should be using a libButterFS, um, and I'll get to that. So the last thing I want to talk about is licensing. So, so just one quick comment on that. Yeah. Th this is a very, very old uh, request, and the challenge has always been, at least with the file system level, that uh, you can do a very generic interface that might be good enough for what a simple, you know, EVMS way back when SSM now might want. But when you think about all of the tuning knobs that a particular file system might have for specialization, which most of the time you don't use, but there will be people who need to use it, uh, it is very, very hard to make a generic library interface that works for everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that, I mean, there have been plenty of times where people have reinvented, um, you know, a wrapper around, you know, MakeFS, and I, I, I guess I'm not sure that trying to create a library interface is actually going to be the best use of everybody's time. Yeah, so, so a long, long time ago, I actually wrote a library interface that basically wrapped my own command line tools, uh, but gave a library interface for EVMS, right? So, and then EVMS lost the LVM battle, and then I dropped it from E2FS progs. I can do it, but I'm just simply going to be wrapping my own command line tools. So, you know, I mean, if that makes people happy, I can do it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, um, I think... I th we talked about th this a little bit at last year's Plumbers, and you, you brought up the issues around the file system. I'm actually not a purist about this. With a file system, with MakeFS, um, you know, if what's working is, is fine, it's just like, I think, I think it's like volume management. That, that needs an API because it's just too complex and it, and it needs an API. So I'm fine with using MakeFS. I'm fine with using Tune2FS. Um, but if, make if, if, the, if the defaults are there for the file systems for the 90% for the case, and and whatever app wants to call that, then then that's my preference. And I'm not I'm, I'm not a zealot. Right. So the thing I've been doing over the past week, and this gets getting to my last topic with the licensing, is looking at. Uh, libifying ButterFS, specifically because it does volume management. Not so much the MakeFS stuff, that's fine, but as a, um, well, let's face it, LVM is really old and ButterFS is really new, and so just kind of hedging our bets here to, to make sure that whichever volume management system uh, is better, then we can use it. So there, uh, so we want, we want a libFS. So the problem with that is that uh, it turns out, that, and I imagine this is also true for a lot of the other existing whatever progs that we, that we wrap our kernel interfaces in, is that it is GPL2. So that means that it is, you can't libify it because then you really, you really if you could go back in time, you would choose a looser li license for this. This isn't actually the code that, uh, this isn't your secret sauce. This is the code that kind of helps people use your secret sauce. And I would advocate that using a looser license than the GPL v2 is, is better for that if you use the LGPL or something looser. So th okay. again, this is the same problem, which is you either, we could make a looser tool that is, is, is effectively a command line wrapper, but if we have to uh, make everything that would be needed to you know, manipulate a file system 
or create a file system or manipulate the LVM be linkable in the same address space uh, as a proprietary application, then we'd have to put the entire thing under an Apache license or a BSD style license and people aren't going to be happy about that. And so sometimes it may very well be that a command line interface is the best way that you can expose the basic stuff without having to take the entire library and putting it under a BSD license. I, I mean, that... <laughs> Well, isn't isn't usually the, the the code that you care about that you that you want to be viral or whatever? Isn't that in the kernel? That's not necessarily in the in the user space tools. It varies a lot. Uh, one of the reasons why I deliberately put the library under a GPL is that I did not want a proprietary partition magic to show up to do some advanced resize tools and then not uh, me, me not get the changes back. So it was actually quite deliberate that the library was under a GPL license. Right, and in fact, ResizeFS was in fact uh, developed by a commercial uh, third-party uh, company that actually did it for Windows, and it was under a license that then eventually reverted to GPL, uh, and part of that was because the library was GPL. So, you know, there are good reasons for that. <laughs> So even lib storage management has a way to direct to vendor proprietary tools, right? So we can avoid the licensing by not linking against it and let you know proprietary vendor tools run sideline and, and call it. It doesn't have to link, right? There are ways of avoiding the the GPL stuff by I forgot what we did with. Yeah, yeah, but, but I mean in general you're either going to be doing a command line wrapper or an RPC wrapper because that's the only way you can put a boundary on the license. Right, so it's right. one or the other. So, so my, my, my guess is that the, the author of, of the Butterfest progs did not actually, just kind of took the license and, and slapped it on there and maybe didn't think as much about, about it as, as Ted did. So I would, but I would encourage if, if you, if, to think about whether or not you want, think about the license for the ancillary software, for the progs. And because what I found is that, okay, so there's the immediate license I mean, I could just go and use the IOCTL interface for Butterfest progs and just for Butterfest and do that. The issue is that, well, I have this huge amount of sample code out there that in Butterfest progs is very tempting. It would be great if I could use that and figure out what you want to do with that. So finally, my last note is just figuring out at the, so we have kernel APIs and then we also have some, in some cases, the only user for that particular API is the command line tool that kind of goes with it. So is the kernel, so do you support other people using the same kernel API or do you really only support people using the command line tools? So I think we need to um, just, just have, have that in mind and, and think about making it possible for libification of these different things. And it really helps tighten things up and, and um, so that's what I'm going to say. I agree. So, um, just one comment on libification. Um, generally, these sort of tools that automate deployments and Puppet and Chef and OpenStack are all written in very high level languages like Ruby or Python. So, it's great writing a C library, but unless you write Ruby or Python bindings, then you're just they're probably just going to wrap your command line tool anyways, because... <clears throat> and they should be documented like the PyPart head. The documentation is the source code. That's it. That's, bad. <laughs> That's really bad, yes. Yeah, so you have, you have a lot of cases where the, 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 sor the source code for the tools is the only documentation of the interface with the kernel interface, which was supposed to be generic, but it just didn't get documented. So you're looking at the code, and it's the only place where you can see how to use it. And so you, re you really don't have an actual kernel interface because it's unusable. It's really unusable without a huge duplication of work. You have the command line interface. So even, when, even if you have a sysfs interface, if it's, or a, you know, a configfs, sysfs, whatever, if it's, it may be theoretically scriptable, but if it's not documented how to use it, if it's not easy enough to use, then you're kind of you're kind of back where you started. It's not. It may be in 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 
practice, in reality, in theoretically, maybe it may be usable by more than just the the who the the progs, but it's not actually usable in a in the real world. So, so just to the final note is that if you are a contributor to Butterfest progs ever, there are a hundred of you. Then expect to get an email from me shortly. Thank you. Yeah, I suspect ButterFS Progs is licensed by Oracle, which, um, and the maintainers don't work there anymore. So we'll see what Larry says. Yeah. <laughs> so, any other questions about Andy's area, or any other kind of quick topics anyone wants to bring up in the uh, last 10, 15 minutes before we get ejected from the room? Hi. Hi, I'm Tawil. Um, I spent this summer at Mozilla, and one of the things that I worked on was uh, transparent decompression for ext4. Um, so it's not supposed to be an ext4-specific topic. Um, I sent out an ugly patch to start a discussion, and I got all sorts of feedback. Um, oh, yeah, very polite. <laughs> um, so. Before I start off, let me just give a little bit of background why we cared about having transparent decompression. Um, the main use case that I talk about everywhere is Firefox on Android. Uh, Firefox loads libzool.so at startup, and you know, Android, as we all know, is, has limited memory, limited whatever. I mean, and as such, libzool.so is pretty big. So what these guys did was they compressed it in a seekable zip format. It's a custom format that they have. And then they have a custom linker, which uh, catches all the six sevs. And you know, when a six sev happens, it knows something has to be brought in and pulls it out from disk, or in this case, flash, uncompresses it, and maps it in there. Uh, obviously, this is not, this is not a nice solution long term because uh, it's going to be useful on Firefox OS devices and I think in general for loading libraries at startup such a feature is useful. Um, so with that in mind I spent the summer trying to implement uh, this for ext4. I sent in a patch to start some discussion. What I did not expect was to also get an lwn.net article. Um, suggestions that I received on the mailing list, uh, don't do it in the kernel, use Fuse. But considering the aim is to improve performance, improve startup performance, that kind of gets Fuse out of the picture almost immediately. Uh, the next thing, and you know, there was quite some discussion on this, was do it in the VFS layer. Um, this is something that can be generic. Uh, Ted had some thoughts about it uh, in a mail. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around it. There were a lot of objections. One of the most common objections was, well, we have a few file systems which already support compression. What about them? Uh, then the other thing was, well, the other problem that you're going to come up with is the compression format of the month. How do you handle that? Uh, then do we need to teach user space tools about the compression format and so on? And Essentially, what I'm looking for is, you know, now that we have a bunch of folks who work on different file systems over here, do you actually think it's useful doing it in the VFS layer? Do you want it remaining, say, within the file system, and so on? Uh, one thing I did forget is uh, I, I received an email off list which uh, suggested that I take a look at ZISOFS, which does essentially what I wanted to do, um, and maybe that might be a model to you know, bring it into the VFS, there will be at least two users using this interface. So. What, what does the ISFS do? Uh, it's essentially a compressed ISFS format. So the ISFS file system compressed. Yeah. So I'll, I'll say what I said on the mailing list, which is uh, this particular technique is actually something which uh, Apple actually has uh, in uh, their uh, OSX, they added it about a year ago. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is a very, very common case for many desktop and mobile handset uses uh, is uh, compression of read-only files, uh, like executables. 
uh, and it is possible to do a better job with compression uh, if you don't need to worry about uh, random writes into your compressed file. Uh, and so optimizing for that in certain use cases where you have uh, slower devices for read-only um, executables can actually make a fair amount of sense. Uh, and if you think about single-channel EMMC flash on uh, mobile handsets, uh, it can actually make a lot of sense and it may actually be useful to do that as, uh, you know, as, in addition to those file systems that want to do a, you know, stacker style, you know, read writable uh, compression, because uh, that is always not going to be as good in order to support that. Uh, so I actually think it's a good thing. I've always been supportive of that as an idea. I've just never had time to implement it. Um, and so my only observation was if you do it that way, it's actually really easy to do it in such a way that it is very simple to enable uh, this feature for multiple file systems as opposed to making it be an ext4 uh, specific feature. Uh, but then it would be up to each file system to decide whether or not they wanted to take advantage of code that could be you know, put in the common VFS layer. Uh, so you have the linker hack today for file systems that don't support it, and you have ButterFS that fully supports writable compression. Uh, so the idea that we'd have this middle layer hack where we compress it somewhere else and write it into the file system compressed and then flip a switch and it comes back decompressed f feels like a hack, right? I mean, if you want a file system to support compression, you can do that work, and it's work, and ButterFS does that work. Or you can do the hacks up in your app and that's always been possible, and the number of people that have been compelled to do that tells you how important this actually is in the ecosystem, right? I mean, we've had this problem, in theory, for a very long time, and no one's bothered. So I think if we implement a hack, and it's a hack when you start to think about MMAP and, you know, a whole bunch of stuff, um, to what end, right? Who uses it, right? Or, or, and then if you do the proper job, Arguably, it's more useful because you don't have this bizarre use case where you have to have a, a compressed seekable zip thing <laughs> that you can't create easily, uh, dump that thing in the file, right? I mean, it, it feels like a hack to me. I'm going to play the devil's advocate. About um, that it's something of a hack. Uh, the fact still is that, uh, you know, the benefits we get for the simplicity that it has is quite a bit, and con I know you say it's been a problem for a while. I agree with that. The yeah. fact still is that now's the time when we have a few million devices which are trying to you know, run Firefox oh, yeah, I know. No, I know. and so I know. on. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. that's kind of why we have the push at this very minute. Yeah, I mean, so you say simplicity. Um, the current code is unusable, right? I mean, it'll get progressively less simple as it stops being buggy, right? I mean, if you look at the compressed the seekable zip implementation in the kernel, it's just wrong. <laughs> it's, there's a ton of bugs it, the, there are. It'll never be merged. Right, so it seems simple on the face, right? Not really you know, tied to a format. The only reason sure. I picked this format is because it was already sure, sure, sure. there. Sure. Fine. Uh, the other thing is that there already is a chunked format which is being used, mm -hmm. the ZISOFS format. Yeah. Presumably, it has been you know vetted and before it went in. Yeah. So we could always just use something like that. Yeah, 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 sure. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's not rewritable, right? I mean, it's it's read only. Well, it it does get used today, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The observation I'll make is we actually do have one worked example of that already, ZISOFS, mm -hmm. and it's there for exactly the same reason, yeah, yeah. Um, which is, you know, CD-ROMs were really slow back then, uh, and, uh, you know, Fuse adds actually, you know, 
in many circumstances what would be considered an unacceptable overhead. And it's management. It's um, unacceptable for the management other, too. The other observation I would make is for read-only files, it's actually really, really easy because you only have to patch your package manager to create mm -hmm. these things. Right? It's not like it's going to be a general purpose thing. You know, the idea is the package manager, when it installs the package, will say, ah, I can do this thing, create the files, and then you know, they're read-only, and that's fine. Um, so that's, that's the intended use case. It's a very, very narrow use case. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think that's the only reason why it would make sense. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I mean, so to be clear, I think Getting compression in the file systems is great. I just don't think this hack is great. I mean, I, I talked to Taurus, right? I, th I, I support the idea. I just don't support this stuff. <laughs> That's, I mean. I mean, I think the ideal situation is that we are able to unify you know, all of these, at least two users that we have at this point in time. Yeah. Well. Anyway, that story. Thank you very much. So um, I think that's it for today. We have uh, a wrap-up session, half an hour. I think they're going to tear down the rooms, reformat things, so you should come back at a quarter after five. I don't know how you magically make all the equipment there. Thank you for the, doing the sound and audio. And thank you all.